to protect our planet for future generations. Sustainable Development Goal 4, which focuses on education, aspires to provide inclusive and equitable quality education and lifelong learning for all 2030. But can we achieve these targets? If we review the global situation today, we find that there are still 263 million children and young people out of school, over 750 million adults are illiterate, 71 million or 13 percent of the youth are unemployed. In addition, 15 percent of the world's population experience some forms of disability. I have tried to give you these headlines relating to the magnitude of the challenge so we don't lose sight of the bigger picture. There is a huge disparity between enrollments in tertiary education in the developing and developed worlds. If you look at the left figure, you find that in four decades, tertiary education enrollments in North America and Europe have more than doubled from 30% to an average of about 70 to 80%. In the developing world, the highest growth has been, this is the right figure, in the Arab states, where the enrollment ratio went up again during the same period from about 7% to between 25 to 30%. Sub-Saharan Africa continues to record an average of about 5 to 7 percent. As Nobel laureate Joseph Stiglitz and his co-author Bruce Greenwald say, and I quote, what truly separates developed from less developed countries is not just a gap in resources or output, but a gap in knowledge. If these divides are, have to be bridged, it cannot be business as usual. In which ways can we harness ODL and technologies to achieve both speed and scale? Technology and distance education have an important role to play in scaling up access to education and training. It's for this reason that Call has consistently advocated for the use of distance learning methods to be adopted not just for formal education, but also for informal and non-formal learning. Even in the US, distance education enrollments continue to grow. According to a recent Babson survey, more than two-thirds, or 67% of the students, are enrolled in at least one distance course in a public institution. But in many developing countries, we find it's a different story as they are leapfrogging straight into mobile learning rather than PC-based, self-paced courses. In fact, the 2016 Ambient Insight report indicates that there has been a negative growth of e-learning in many developing countries. Asia and Africa have several mobile-only countries. In mobile-only countries, the mobile is the dominant device needed to access the internet, and people are introduced to learning content through apps. So these are some of the trends for us to watch. But then the next question you'll ask is that can education help us achieve sustainable development? A World Bank study shows that one additional year of schooling for women can result in a 20% increase in their income, which is significant. Even a 0.1% improvement in a country's education equality can result in an over 23% increase in per capita income. So equality is also important. In Ethiopia, six years of education for farmers can result in a better contribution to soil conservation and more environment-friendly agricultural practices. There is a clear link then between education, economic growth, equity, environmental conservation, and sustainable development. One of the objectives of this forum then is to collectively look at the bigger picture and exchange knowledge and experiences on how we can make a difference. What are the important trends that will affect our policy and practice? How can we work in partnership and collaborate to identify joint actions to achieve our common goals? In order to be more inclusive, we organized four online discussions based on the sub-themes of the forum during April to September. Each online event lasted for one month. 
We are very grateful to the moderators and the facilitators from both OUM and CALL who actually conducted these uh, discussions. Participants came from 66 countries, uh, both Commonwealth and non-Commonwealth. The summary of the, the summary report can be accessed from the CALL website and I'll give you, you the link. The discussions were very rich and nuanced, but let me just share the highlights. Some of the recurring th themes were OER for quality and equity, appropriate technologies for access and inclusion, research for improving policy and practice, and harnessing ODL for formal and non-formal learning. Over the next three days, we have a full agenda. Some of the key questions could re relate to how the various developments in technologies, mobile devices, learning analytics, big data, success will depend on how technology can be effectively harnessed in the interests of people and pedagogy. How can we open up education to include the hitherto excluded constituencies? How can we develop innovative models and methods to achieve impact with speed and scale? And finally, how can we promote lifelong learning that contributes to sustainable development? I hope some of these questions will be taken up as we discuss how to catalyze change within our own contexts and what we can do collectively to expedite the process. At this PCF, we will prepare the Kuala Lumpur Declaration, which will capture your ideas, suggestions, and discussions, and distill these into key recommendations that we can take forward. Leading this process are our Vice President, Dr. Bala, Stamenka Ubilich Trumbich, formerly of UNESCO and a close partner of CALL, and Professor Shari of Open University Malaysia, and you can email your comments and suggestions to them at the ID given here. Alternatively, you can also give your comments on CALL's Facebook and Twitter pages. So on that note, let me once again welcome you to PCF8. Thank you very much, Professor, for bringing us up to speed on the state of open learning and its impact on sustainable development. Ladies and gentlemen, we also have the pleasure now to hear from Yang Babahagia Tan Sri Emeritus Professor Dr. Raj Danarajan. May we call upon Yang Babahagia Tan Sri to come forward to deliver his speech. Thank you so much. One thing that I, I learned, having spent some eight or nine years at the Commonwealth of Learning, and having to attend uh, meetings of this kind when there were so many grand and very eminent people is a fear of missing acknowledgement of someone or other who is present. And a Nigerian chief taught me this. He said, simply say, without offending anybody, all protocols observed. And I observed all protocols. Colleagues, good afternoon. Allow me to perhaps begin this presentation by thanking the two presidents who are co-hosting PCF 8 and for inviting me to this conference. It's a pleasure and a special privilege to share this platform with both of you as well as the current chair of the Call Board of Governors. Both Prof. Manso of OUM and Prof. Kanwa of the Commonwealth of Learning have brought a lot of pride to the respective organizations by organizing this event here in Kuala Lumpur. This eighth forum is the second such in Southeast Asia. The first being the very first, uh, uh, the first being uh, uh, the PCF1 hosted by the Ministry of Education in the Royal Kingdom of Brunei in 1999. The first PCF was both groundbreaking 
and refreshing in many senses of the word. For the first time, the Commonwealth of Learning brought together some 200 or so individuals from 50, maybe 50, 49 Commonwealth countries to share views and experiences on ODL and to celebrate the Commonwealth achievements in open distance learning. It was also the first time that we introduced an online forum. It lasted something like three to six weeks and, and the summary of those forums are presented in a plenary here. I think you're going to be doing that as well. It was also the very first time a number of ministers of the Commonwealth uh, of Education got to hear about opportunities, experiences, challenges around and about open distance learning from the practitioners themselves. Also, for the first time, a government of the Commonwealth from the South underwrote the complete cost of hosting that meeting but with very little tangible benefits accrued to itself. The generosity of the Royal Kingdom of Brunei towards the Commonwealth was truly remarkable. It was again the first time at least the practitioners from the developing parts of the Commonwealth dominated the meeting with their enthusiasm, their scholarship, their insight, stories of successes and in some cases failures as well for an educational practice that was thought of at that time perhaps a ritual monopoly. We demonstrated in 1999 that we in the Commonwealth have just as much to contribute to the growing knowledge of distance education in a practical and very pragmatic way as the rest of the world. It is significant to note that the conference also used its keynote addresses to highlight the value of open education beyond education by inviting speakers from diverse fields such as development, the diasporas, health, poverty, agriculture and rural development. The best demonstration of the impact of the first conference is this meeting here the in a country whose government did not think distance education was a respectable provision even in the early 1980s. But today, 16 years later, since that first meeting, Malaysia has come a long way in accepting and promoting distance education, at least its version of it, in many forms and through many of its institutions, albeit by, ra by private rather than the public purse, requiring users of education to bear the full cost of that experience by themselves. Sadly, sadly, there is this prevailing and perhaps, in my view, a short-sighted view amongst policy circles that adults, and especially those who are working could and should pay for, post, for their post-secondary education and they should not burden the Treasury. I have constantly argued over a period of time that while adults have a personal responsibility, it should be a shared one with both governments, industry, business and other employers. After all, the benefits, benefits of a highly educated citizenry is a whole nation rather, just, rather than just one individual. When first asked by the President of the Commonwealth of Learning to address this August gathering, I was somewhat uncertain as to what one should say on such an occasion, an opening occasion. And looking at the luminaries that organizers have lined up to enrich your intellect, I'm humble to be even present and def definitely even more convinced at my very modest contemporary knowledge of the field, its drivers and future trajectories, and cannot therefore add much value to what you already know. Those of you who are gathered here know more about and have a greater insight on the present state of affairs and practice of open and distance education than I could possibly even imagine adding to. Having left the Commonwealth of Learning some 12 years ago, my knowledge of contemporary development of the Commonwealth is modest at best. Living in a country such as Malaysia, 
use of the commonwealth is neither common nor is it rich. We as a nation are more focused rather pragmatically on the region that we are here and, and faith-based groups than multilateral development groups like the commonwealth. So rightly or wrongly, on this occasion, I've chosen to share a reflection of my 35 years of personal journey through district education in a career that began here in Malaysia and worked its way around a large part of the world before returning back to Malaysia to establish this country's second open university. This occasion also presents me an opportunity for me to share with this learned group a personal perspective of the changing nature of open learning, both ideologically and practically. I am an accidental distance education worker. As a young academic in the mid-60s, it was not a sector in higher education that I had planned nor aspired to spend time on. Working in a young, young university in Penang, a fishing village in 1970, as a biological scientist, the law of studying termite behavior, nutrient recycling in tropical forests, and participating in this nation's conservation activism was a much more attractive proposition for me than to, to be worrying about the thousands of Malaysians who in, 19, in the early 70s aspired for a higher education, but their personal circumstances somehow either prevented them access or worse still, ministerial and institutional policies and practices simply um, erected, erected barriers of one kind or another. However, a socially conscious young vice chancellor of the then University of Penang wanted to reach out to such individuals, denied or prevented by launching an off-campus studies program, modeled very much after the external studies programs of the Australian universities, especially the University of New England, and persuaded me that I should take up the challenge of organizing the science segment of that university's attempt at education. What began as a reluctant initial first step turned out to be a lifelong passion, which saw me moving from Penang, Malaysia, to Hong Kong, and then to the Commonwealth of Learning, and finally back here. It has been a most enriching and rewarding and certainly satisfying journey, though once in a while I do long to study termites, build your castles. In choosing to be reflective in the next few minutes of so, show, so I wish to share with you a question that began bothering me, especially in the last 10 years or so. Even as I was beginning, began preparing myself for active retirement the last 10 years or so. That question is about what it means to be open today. In an ever and constantly changing times and in the context of the not so rich nations, which unfortunately is home to perhaps the greatest proportion of the educational deprived peoples of the Commonwealth. It is a question I'm sure that many of you yourselves have asked and one that requires a principled response, especially because the foundations of our practice have been predicated passionately in making learning available to all. Does open, by definition, include reaching out to the very last person in the queue, or is it more restrictive in practice? We need to engage in this new debate as a new generation of Commonwealth citizens begin to compete and to find a place for themselves under the sun against a world that is becoming challenging to live, work and survive. Our debate should be about openness to learning and what, what, it, and what it means in our changing landscape. The founding vice chancellor of the first and perhaps the most successful open university in modern times, Walter Perry, considered the concept of openness in higher education, perhaps the result of three converging trends in post-war Europe. The trends he identified, the political objective of promoting the spread of an education for all, concerns regarding the provision or lack of adult education, 
and the growth of educational broadcasting. The editor of uh, the Open Review of Educational Re Research, Peters, very recently opined that concept of openness then was based on social democratic principles that emphasize inclusiveness and the equality of opportunity. The mechanism of this notion of openness followed that of industrial broadcast mass media, which was designed to reach a large audience on a one-to-many logic. Close quote. The thing is, almost all of the leading thinkers of the time in the Western world especially were very much on the same track. It would not be an exaggeration to say that influenced many of us in the Commonwealth, in the developing world. Noticing the intense deprivation of opportunities to higher education, especially in many countries, we were caught up with the ideals of openness being defined and presented by a post-war Europe and perhaps North America as well. Leaders like uh, Professor Khan, of the, uh, the person who established the Alama Iqbal Open University, Professor Reddy, who established IGNU, the National Open University of India, Professor Jeff Mari, who established the Open University of Tanzania, and organizations such as UNESCO and the development banks with sufficient clout and imagination, persuaded hosts of governments to establish institutions of open learning to enhance access and widen participation. We were all caught up both by our romantic ideals as well as the wonders of broadcasting and began celebrating our worldview of openness using one teacher and through broadcasting of print reaching thousands of learners simultaneously. We exuberated. But a new generation of educators and technologists are challenging us to pause and ask whether our current practices, especially in the middle and low income economies, are really that open as we should and would, would like it to be. Thoughts of a new de definition certainly have been emerging and are currently emerging in educational circles, perhaps in the light of the new technologies of openness as the Web 2, which, pro which promise greater interactivity, collaboration, reach, flexibility to learning led by expressions of openness in the software development environment and increasingly based on models of open source, open access, open archives, open data, and open resources. Where open ed distance education, as we had continued to practice in many, well, many Commonwealth countries, is based on the logic of centralized, industrialized, mass media characterized by a broadcast one-to-many mode. The new mode is based on a radically decentralized, many-to-many -many mode of interactivity. To exemplify the attraction and ex excitement of this new approach, consider the loud noise over the last five years around the globe by the interests of the mass online open courses. It is not just the glamour of institutions such as MIT or Stanford or Harvard or Oxford and the likes in Europe which are pushing this forward, but parts of Asia, but also the immense flexibility to learning without restrictions in terms of time, space, importantly, just informal institutional uh, affiliation of the learner that this new openness provided and coupled with innovations in licensing arrangements, licensing arrangements such as the OER, the free and unrestricted access to use and reuse content, the new thinking is also about access to that content by learners without a need for institutional affiliations. At the heart of any dialogue on open education, concern, concern is constantly expressed about the inadequacy of equ equitable education. Perhaps the emergence, despite the emergence of so many efforts. For instance, a report by the Asian Development Bank very recently regarding Asia says that while access has certainly improved manifold through open and distance teaching institutions, it was still being confined to a limited group of citizens. Many others who had been historically marginalized 
continue to be left on the sidelines for many reasons. These reasons range from the, un from the known economic underpreparedness to the unknown social status, self-esteem, language inabilities. Therefore, it is become, becoming essential that in order to move towards a more equitable provision and much more imaginative policies and practices have to be designed to bring these others into the catchment. I have therefore to ask those of you here if it is time for a new kind of openness within the Commonwealth and among the Commonwealth nations. Is it time to move from the old comfort zones to the new zones of challenge that is now? Should we start moving towards a, a different openness? This openness recognizes and embraces change in what we now know of and about cognition, pedagogy, as well as the arrival of amazing technologies and conventions. All of this through an openness that not only respects the rights of all citizens to higher education, or education indeed, in a manner that they're able to access and use it, but also the manner in which we, as, produ as providers, produce, deliver, assess, and credential content. This will require leaders of vision and courage to survive as a distinct people and learner-centered and driven institutions of higher learning. Open distance teaching institutions need to become truly open. That would mean exercising choices and making innovative decisions. Like many in the open education movement, I argue that over the, last, over the period of the last decade, those of us in the open education movement may have lost the leadership that we once captured. I argue we must take possession of that higher ground in terms of creating a new openness that would be equitable, that's available to that last person in the queue. Open universities to a great extent pioneered open higher and distance education. Technology has enabled many institutions to be a distance provider, but it is a belief in equity, in fairness, and opportunity for all to experience education that was unique about open learning, open learning institutions. We should reclaim that leadership, utilizing all the tools that have become available to us. We either reform or we may indeed become one of the crowd. We have choices. The choices and decisions relate to the products, the clients, and the methods that we are going to be adopting. And perhaps more radically, we may have to help change everything among and about education in low and middle income Commonwealth countries. Reflecting and reviewing about this will be a way to regain the leadership in higher education and education, something that leaders before us, Walter Perry, Ram Reddy, uh, Khan, have done. And this may mean asking very similar questions that they must have asked, such as to what extent Commonwealth Open Education practitioners and institutions are facing and have to face, face up to the new social inequities in education. Are those of us practicing and pro promoting open education uh, being compromised in our beliefs by perhaps more neoliberal policies of many Commonwealth countries which are gung-ho in pri pri privatizing educational services? And are, tho are those of us in open education bringing the kind of radical transformation that education requires to meet the challenges posed by the new constructs. And creating alternatives to the status quo perhaps is one method of introducing change to what and to what extent has open education resisted and challenged mainstream education in bringing about that change. It is perhaps time to take, the char take charge again and lead again. Thank you so much.
Thank you, Yang Babhagya Tansri, for leaving us with much to ponder upon throughout PCF 8. We would now like to humbly request that Yang Babhagya Tansri that you remain by the lectern to chair the upcoming session, which is the Asa Briggs Lecture. For your comfort during the lecture, may we invite Professor Datuk Dr. Manso, Professor Dr. Asha Kanwa, and Dr. Linda Sim Simmons to step off the stage and take your seats at the front of the hall. Ladies and gentlemen, our featured speaker is also a former president and CEO of Call. May we invite Sir John Daniel O.C. to join Tansri Dr. Danaraj on the stage. <laughs> Yamba Bahagya Tansri, the floor is yours now to take control. Can you just give me a minute to get set up, Raj? <laughs> While we're waiting, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to make a few housekeeping announcements. For your information, there will be a wel for the welcoming dinner tonight. We have, uh, if you intend to bring a companion, we have opened up a payment counter next to the registration area for your convenience. Okay. Also, there will be a Commonwealth of Learning 